The Data Engineering Show is brought to you by Firebolt. It's the cloud data warehouse for insanely fast analytics over terabytes of data with fewer resources. Welcome back, everyone, to, to the Data Engineering Show. Uh, today, it's just at least on the host side, just myself. Uh, Eldad is out on a well-deserved vacation. Uh, but our guest, at least, makes more than up for it. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of great having you, Zach. Uh, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the show. Do you want to tell us a bit more kind of about yeah, you, yeah. your story, your background? Yeah, active? yeah, for sure. So like, uh, you know, I've been doing big data for a long time, like uh, since like about 2014, 2015. Like I actually started my career in like data science, doing like analytics stuff, doing like Tableau and SQL and stuff like that. But I realized that I like to build more than I like to like build models and query data and stuff like that. And that's where I found this nice intersection with data engineering. And I got this job at Teradata back in 2015. And like, I've mostly been on the data engineering train since then. I've like kind of fallen off like every once in a while where I've been like, I'm done with pipelines. I don't want to do this anymore. But then I like, I end up coming back around. I end up coming back around. Like it happened at that, that especially happened near the end of my time at Facebook where I was like, I'm done with data engineering. I'm out. And, but then I came back around. And so like, uh, it's been great. And then uh, more recently, last, uh, Last month or so, I decided uh, it was time to uh, do content full time and to also try some other things out. So I'm actually doing, uh, I have three separate things I'm trying to do right now. One is content. Uh, I make content on five platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, YouTube. Those are the five that I'm on right now. And awesome. uh, it's been been fun. Uh, really trying to get those rhythms going and like get that like pattern going of just like video because I, I have a theory that uh, actually all social media is going to merge into like short form one to two minute videos that like they're all kind of going that way. It's interesting because I've even seen the short form videos perform really well on LinkedIn as well, where it's like, I'm okay. like, wow, like, oh, this is cool. Like, I'm like, and it makes it easier for me because then I'm like, oh, I can make one video post it five times. Whereas before it was like, I had to make a LinkedIn post and then convert it to a video. And it was just like, there was a lot more like processing and all these steps to it. Right. So I think that that's like one of the things for me is like, I really do think that video is going to be uh, a big part of the future. But like, so that's that's one. Uh, the second thing is I'm doing a data engineering boot camp. So I have uh, taken on about 50 students and I'm doing a six week boot camp for them. It's I call it like uh, it's kind of like the good to great uh, boot camp. So this is not like a breaking into data engineering boot camp. This is you have a job as a data engineer and you want to learn the skills that are going to take you to the next level and they're going to make you a better data engineer. And so that is definitely uh, what I've been working on. Uh, the very first session of that is tomorrow. So like we're starting day one, week one tomorrow. And it's been like a lot of like planning and uh, stuff like that. And that's been really fun. And the third thing I have is um, I have this platform called Tech Creator, which is going to be a platform that makes a lot of like kind of managing your job as a tech creator easier. And um, it, it's going to have like these chat GPT plugins to make content creation easier. And like, it, especially like content creation in your voice. That's the part that's going to be really, really exciting. That stuff should all be done in the next couple months as well. So uh, get, be on the lookout for that stuff. So techcreator.io, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing in the last month or so. Awesome. So I'll, I'll definitely be on the lookout. And like, that's a, that's a lot of stuff to talk about. So like, let's start right in the beginning, right? Kind of like then... A month back, kind of, you made the decision. Okay, I'll, I'll leave kind of my like comfy job at Airbnb, kind of become full time, focus on kind of content creation and all of these other things you talked about. Take us through that journey, right? So, like at this point, I think you have like more than two hundred fifty thousand followers on LinkedIn. So that's obviously a kind of huge audience. What what actually got you started, kind of like creating content, kind of sharing, yeah, sharing your knowledge, all of that that's, stuff. That's good. Like, uh, I think there's kind of like two journeys here that are important, and one of them is like a content creation journey, and one of them is like a confidence journey. But I think they both matter. So content creation, I've actually been doing content for a very long time. Uh, so I started posting almost daily in 2010, 2011, when I was like 16, 17 years old. And a lot of that content is really terrible. Uh, it, it, like, I, it's all on Facebook. Like, it, and and I only have like 500 people there, and I intentionally keep it small because there's so much bad content. Like, I think I feel like I need to go back through and delete some of it because I feel like I'm gonna get canceled. But, but anyways, <laughs> but, um, so, like, so that was also technical already, or kind uh, of no, like just, no, it was just whatever thoughts. was on your mind. It was mostly on my my thoughts and my perspectives. Like, and it kind of shifted over time. Like for a while, it was like just my thoughts about like school and math 
And then it was more like, uh, especially like after that, it was like more into like politics because like three or four years, I got like way into politics for a while. Like I was like way about that, like 2013 to 2016, I was like obsessed. And that's like all I wrote about was politics. And then uh, I would say after that, especially after I got the job at Facebook, it started to get more technical. And then uh, and then I realized like one of the things I realized about it was uh, in it was actually like in 2020, like when I quit my, this is something that happened when I quit my job at Netflix. I remember telling people, I was like, like I, I, when I quit, I was like, I, uh, you're going to know my name. <laughs> like I, I'm going to, you're going like, to, I'm, I'm going to come back around and you're going to see me. Like I promise. And, uh, and even though th- at that point I had no big following or anything like that, I already, but I, I had the feeling that I knew the skills that I needed to get engagement and all that stuff. And then I really started uh, making content consistently a couple months before I got in at Airbnb. It was like December 2020. And, um, and then that was when, yeah, things have been going pretty well since then. Like I like, uh, it's been consistency is the main thing, right? Where, so now since then, since December, since December, 2020, I show up and post almost every day for the last two and a half years. I've missed, I think 12 times I've, I've not posted 12 days in the last two and a half years. So, uh, Consistency is important, and I, I I try to shoot for like ninety five ish percent of the days. So like I get like one day a month, right, where I'm like yeah, I I don't need to make content today. So but like that's um and that, that consistency is I think one of the big important factors of like why I've experienced so much growth because that's the part that's hard. That's the part that is challenging. That's what, that's the part that like separates me from a lot of people is like uh is that and. I know I'd say that that's like been the the main thing, and now now it's been like now that I have more time, it's been like very interesting because it's like uh, there's like so many different strategies on how to like grow like cross platform and all that stuff. But yeah, I'd say that's my journey for sure. Gotcha, super super cool. So, but I mean that's that's interesting, right? So you actually kind of started out uh, kind of like just posting on random stuff uh, or kind of whatever was on your mind, and then kind of I guess kind of like over time. You, you found more of kind of like your technical audience in a sense. Uh, that's that's super interesting. Like, at least on my end, right? Uh, like, I always feel like there's a certain kind of like uh, barrier to writing something, right? Kind of like, or like, like, like kind of being like, oh, like, do I actually have something to say which is smart enough? Do, yeah, like, will people definitely, care? All definitely. That, that, and that's what I was saying about these two journeys, right? One of them is a content journey and one of them is a confidence journey. And I feel like for me, that confidence journey was like, especially after I got the like the staff, like tech lead role at Airbnb, then I was like, okay, like I have the credential now, right? I, I People are going to care what I have to say now, right? And that like, and that made a big boost for me and just in like my, uh, my own perspective of my own thoughts, I guess, in that like, wow, okay, I can actually do these things. Woke up one day, looked at your CV and you're like... Hell yeah, kind of like I'm I, I have the credibility now. I can I can start writing about this. Yeah, and like I realize now though that like that that was actually kind of stupid of me. That like actually the correct way to go is to just put your thoughts out there and let let uh, let the algorithms and let the audience decide if it's valuable, not whether you think you are credible already. Because I mean, I see these I like for example, there's a couple of people on LinkedIn I follow who are in high school, right? They're 18-ish years old, and they have 25,000 followers on LinkedIn, and they're in high school, right? And it's like, okay, like, and and like, 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 there's no way they have the credibility or the established. They're in high school. They're still learning, right? And that's like, but that's the thing that like I learned in my journey here is that like really it's more about just putting your thoughts out there, putting your opinions out there, and letting uh, letting the the feedback come. And then, then you can know if you know what you're talking about or not, because like you'll get the feedback from the internet about it. And like, and I think that's actually one of the beautiful things, like that. Like for me, I think was actually an unnecessary barrier. And I, I for me, I'm like, I, I wish I would have started earlier. I wish I because I had the, I feel like I had the content writing skills, like for many years, for many many years. I think I, I learned those in like three or four years, like kind of the copywriting skills of like how to write content that's engaging. As opposed to like, you know, content that's maybe educational is a separate skill, but engaging content is like pretty universal. And so like, and I, I, for me, I think that that was actually a mistake and a thinking error where I'm like, oh, I have to build up all this credibility and resume before I should speak. And that's actually like, uh, definitely one of the things that I want anyone watching this podcast make content, just like put your thoughts out there. Doesn't matter. doesn't matter where you're at. Like, remember 
There's people on LinkedIn who have 25,000 followers who are in high school and they're making money from LinkedIn. And like, they, they, there's no way they have more credibility than you. Like, uh, and so, like, and so definitely just remember that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Super cool. So, uh, like, this kind of another thing I find interesting, right? Is kind of, okay, like, kind of now you're super focused on kind of data engineering, both in terms of like technical kind of content, right? Like, I watched some of your TikToks today about uh, kind of explain about window functions, those types of things, and kind of really like, digging into how to uh, how to be a successful data engineer and then also kind of things around kind of okay how to build like a career in data engineering so uh, how yeah kind of like how, how do you make the decision right and kind of like what's worthwhile content kind of what yeah uh, exactly yeah, that's that's great I think some of it is there's kind of two sides to it is that like some of it is around uh, I get feedback from people. This is where TikTok's really amazing, where LinkedIn needs to do better on this. But like TikTok, like the people in the comment section, they give me so many ideas. They give me so many ideas where I'm like, yeah, that's totally right. That's totally like the thing that I need to be talking about right now. And like, because for me, that's actually one of the things that I like have found interesting and kind of perplexing about content is that like the content that I really like to write about is the content that is like, I would say more like intermediate to advanced data engineering. But if you post that stuff, like a lot of times, like it kind of bombs because it's just like not relevant to most people. <laughs> and so, and that makes it so the content doesn't well, doesn't do well. But like on the flip side, I don't want to do like just like 101 content because I just feel that that market is already like tapped. That that like the, the there's enough creators teaching select and group by and where and like, I don't need to be teaching that. Right. So for me, I'm trying to like find a way to make this kind of uh, these more intermediate advanced concepts more approachable. And that's the tricky part. Right. Because like when usually my V1, I write it and I'm like, uh, no, nah, this is like this is more like for practitioners, not for people learning. And so that it's like a it's an interesting balancing act. But then there's like the other side of it of like, OK, um, like more than just like the technical content, like of like how to do a data engineering, like the like the actual nuts and bolts of it, but like how to grow your career, how to like be a, like, because I feel it's how to do data engineering and how to be a data engineer. Those are separate like uh, um, things, right? And so I definitely think that like, that's one of the things for me is like, especially on LinkedIn, this is something I learned. Uh, there's this lady named Leah Turner on LinkedIn. Definitely follow her. She's amazing. And uh, she has this uh, framework where there's three there's three types of content, right? You have show content, which is just explaining something, a concept, right? Then you have grow content, which is going to be more around like inspiring people to take action or like really speaking to their emotions, right? And then there's a third piece of content, which is like get to know, right? And that's how they, they can learn more about me. They can learn more about my story and my uh, journey. And I, I found that like if you kind of, those three buckets, like for me personally, I think the correct breakdown of those three buckets is show content should be like half, grow content should be like 30% or 40% and get to know content should be like 10%. It's like the spice that goes in there a little bit much because like you don't, you want to be careful to get to know stuff because like if you post it too often, people just like they, they unfollow, they boo you like, and like, it's very like, but, but, but if you post it, if, like, it, but infrequently though sometimes those posts can be your most viral pieces though right and it's like but you just don't want to talk about yourself all the time otherwise people are like this guy's full of himself he only wants to talk about himself like and so you want to be careful with that type of content because it's powerful but also dangerous gotcha so in in terms of the show side of things right would you mm -hmm. say it's kind of one of those three pillars like right so on my end like i'm just kind of like c plus plus database nerd kind of i care mm -hmm. about like how to build concurrent index structures, I don't know, like how to build a fast multi-threaded join and so on. And like, whenever I look at data engineering, right, and kind of like I interface with a lot of data engineers at Firebolt, kind of it's always seems kind of really daunting just because like the kind of breadth of the field in terms of the like just amount of different technologies you have um, just just seems so crazy, right? Uh, so like how, how do you decide on kind of what, kind of what to like focus on in terms of actually kind of, yeah, like teaching people kind of skills that are valuable for their career? Yeah, well, that's that's great. That's actually a great, great question. So like for my boot camp, for example, right, uh, there's six weeks. Only two of those weeks are actually tech specific. 
The other four weeks are not tech specific. They're tech agnostic. So uh, where, um, because I think there's a couple things and a couple philosophies that are really important in data engineering that are actually like, they apply regardless of if you're using Spark or Snowflake or Databricks or Presto or Flink or like whatever, you know, tech you want to use for it. And uh, there's a couple of them. Like one is like around like data modeling, how to do how to do proper data modeling for dimensions and facts and how to really get those things like uh, compacted down. And there's a lot of trade offs in that space that is very art, very it's not as science and it's a lot more art and you have to understand like your consumers yeah and they have to have that empathy and that part is uh powerful like like for example for me like when i was working at airbnb like i would say 80 to 90 percent of the impact i had was going to be in two buckets right it was in le- the leadership bucket of inspiring other people and to and, and helping them grow and the other one is data modeling and getting making robust data models that can then be used by a large number of people downstream what wasn't as important was like how good I was at Spark. Like, I mean, I look at Spark as more of like a means of accomplishing something or like as like a, it's just one kind of path forward. And that like, you just, it, it, it solves the problem and maybe it can be a little bit faster. Maybe it can solve those things. But really, this is the fundamental thing that I think a lot of data engineers need to remember is your product that you sell is data. It's not a pipeline. A pipeline, it can help, right? In terms of maintenance and like pain and suffering. Like if your pipeline sucks, then like the data is going to be annoying. But like generally speaking, the value you're providing is in the data sets that you provide. And that is like, and if those data sets are not modeled properly, then that's where you can have a lot of unnecessary cost, right? And like and, and, and in big tech companies, these mistakes actually cost them millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. Because of like, uh, if if you don't model things the right way, then downstream the compression doesn't work the same way, and then uh, it can blow the data up again, right? And there's a lot of interesting like uh, tricky things that I've noticed with like how data modeling works. So that's one. I'd say another kind of tech agnostic thing is around um, data quality, right? And understanding. There, again, there's technologies here like Amazon DQ and Great Expectations, and there's going to be 10 trillion more coming. And uh, but like, it's more again around like how to test data, like of like is this quality, is it not quality? How to validate it, right? That's very like agnostic of like the tech that you're using, and you should definitely be able to do that. And then the last bucket of things that are tech agnostic is storytelling, right? Can you tell a compelling story? Can you like make some cool charts? Can you persuade people to give you the time to make this data and other things like that? Because there's like the story, there's like the before data story. And then there's also the after you have data story. And both of those stories matter. And being able to construct those narratives in a compelling way, very important persuasion. And then the tech is the last one. And like, and like, in some ways, I think the last one, but also not as important. And but it's tricky because, and this is the thing I hate about industry in some regards, is that like, if you go into an interview, right, and and uh, it, you go into the interview, like, eighty uh, percent of the questions are going to be on like Spark or Flink or like, and be like, oh, oh, do you know this very specific minor detail about Spark? And it's like, dude, like this doesn't matter that much actually in the end. But like, but that's how it's t- things are tested, right? And I hope that industry changes in that way. Gotcha. So, but, I mean, looking like, um, like, right, looking at this bootcamp, because you're framing it in that context, kind of, you said at the beginning, it was like, the goal is kind of from good to great. So usually, like, those will be people who already know Spark, right, kind of know how to maybe, like, write Scala code for their Spark stuff, like yep. those types of things. On the other end, and kind of there's, like, hard to say from good to great, is like, okay, you have someone, right, maybe that, okay, not the influencer with 25,000 followers talking about data engineering, but just someone wrapping up high school who wants to get into data engineering uh, and yeah. kind of, you have to pick up some technology, right? And like mm-hmm. there, it just seems kind of like daunting to, in a sense, like make that choice, right? Kind of what horses do you bet on? Kind of with what do you get started to actually start with that career? I mean, I totally agree. I think it's, it, it, it's similar to, um, uh, like, so I'm a pretty like athletic sporty guy, right? And like one of the things that I remember as a kid Growing up, my parents were always like, you got to do sports, right? And then I was like, okay. And like, then like I tried a bunch of them. I tried like soccer. I tried basketball. I tried baseball. I tried like all these different sports that like were all 
interesting and different. And like, but one of the things that I learned about it was, especially going through that process was like, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta pick one and be like, I'm going to get good at this one. And for me, that was basketball. And I mean, I got lucky I'm tall or I'm six two, So ba- basketball was the easy, obvious choice. And that's one of the things that's tricky about tech sometimes is that the choices aren't so obvious, right? They're not like, oh yeah, this one is six seven and this one's four two, so we should go with the taller one or whatever, right? It's not that like uh, obvious a lot of the time. And so I think there's kind of a couple pieces there, like on like how to pick like technologies. Is one is going to be like, okay, what do you see on social media? <laughs> like, like, I know that that's like, uh, it w- and I'm not going to say all social media because I still don't trust TikTok here. But on LinkedIn, like, it, like, if you have enough of a network on LinkedIn, do a poll. Polls are broken on LinkedIn. Like, if you do a poll on LinkedIn, like, even if you have no followers, it's going to be seen by like 10,000 people because polls are broken and they're very good. And the, the reach they get is too good. And so you can learn, you can ask, right? And uh, I found that the, there's like two or three really high fidelity sources of like where like where to get like good information. You have LinkedIn. LinkedIn doesn't give you the thing about LinkedIn though is it doesn't give you very it's not not as good about negative feedback. Like so if, if you're like asking someone to be like, hey, say why my video sucks, most people aren't gonna do that in the comments comment section on LinkedIn because like they're like, I don't want to look like an asshole. Right? And so that's one. Uh, Reddit, Reddit's better for that. Reddit's almost too good for that. If, if you want people to tear you down, go to Reddit. Like uh, that, uh, Reddit or bl- Blind's even better if you, uh, if you really want to get... Uh, th- but th- those places, you can also get the more like guidance on like, okay, should I learn these texts or these texts, right? And like, I think like really the, the, the big things are going to be just like learning the languages first, SQL, Python, right? If you really want to break into DE, SQL, Python, learn the languages first, and then you can learn the tech after that, actually. Because you can do, like, if you just do, like, Postgres to learn SQL, just like a very basic database, then you can build into the more complicated ones like Snowflake or Firebolt or Spark or whatever you want to use, right? And then, like, you can kind of go into the cloud that way. And, like, I found I found that kind of building more locally first and like kind of learning languages that way. I've I've had more success with some students kind of teaching them that way as opposed to like being like, okay, here's how you set up an EC2 instance on AWS and now you have a a, a computer in the cloud and it's going to crunch the data for you. And like a lot of that like, feels like a lot more complexity that they don't really need yet until they have more confidence in their own skills. Looking looking at SQL databases, I guess kind of one of the good things is looking at the space right now is like so many uh, like so many systems are actually kind of converging around the Postgres dialect. Uh, there's not like you need to kind of learn like seven different kind of flavors of like SQL or like window function syntaxes, whatever. Uh, actually, like a lot of the systems tend to behave uh, at least more similar to today than maybe they used to uh, some some time ago. So that's that's super cool. So thanks thanks for the insights there. I mean, like I'm sure a, a lot of the listeners kind of will will appreciate that. Um, cool. So zooming out a bit, right, from the kind of specific technology, like, do you see any kind of big kind of trends at the moment? Like when I look at LinkedIn, for example, like one thing that keeps coming up is like data observability, kind of data monitoring, data quality, like those seem to be what some of the things kind of generating a lot of a lot of buzz kind of, yeah, what, what else is out there? Right yeah, now? like data monitoring, ML ops, data versioning, there's all sorts of like interesting things and then there's like a couple of them that come back around sometimes like data mesh like i hear data mesh like once every three months or something like that and i'm like hey it's there it's a thing right and uh but like uh i think uh the couple things that i really am seeing yeah is definitely data observability of like yo like how is this data changing over time and like it's very closely linked with data quality and honestly they should be closely linked because if you aren't aware of like how your data, like the uh, the shape of your data, what it looks like over time, then you really don't have good data quality checks because you haven't done your due diligence on looking at like what is normal and what is abnormal. Like, I mean, there's data quality checks out there that are very easy to know or like what is normal and not normal. Like, is there any data? No data is abnormal, right? <laughs> or like this column's null when it should never be null. That's abnormal. Very easy check. But then things, it could get like what you define as normal versus abnormal. It gets more and more complicated as like you look at like more and more like different data points in to, together. 
And that's where like, you know, if you look at like week over week row counts, that's like going to be one that uh, what is abnormal versus normal. It depends because a lot of times those week over week row counts like on Christmas Day, they fail because there's like not as much data or there's too much data. And like and it's just it's actually not like you're looking at the wrong period instead of like week over week. You really should be like looking year over year and looking at it kind of at a, on, on like zooming out to like find the actual like pattern that matters the most. And I mean, that's why people do week over week, right? Instead of day over day because of like the Sunday, Monday uh, uh, phenomena. And like Sunday, Monday is super annoying as well. Like that one's very common to like trip people up. That's why week over week is better, but it still misses the like holiday patterns, right? So I think that those kind of like observability things are super important because it's linked to quality and that is linked to trust. And because it's like without quality, you don't have trust, right? And definitely, I, I think that that I would say is the big thing that I, I've definitely been seeing. I've also been seeing a little bit more of a push towards like streaming and trying to get more people involved with like, I've been hearing about ClickHouse like so much recently. Like everyone's like, you got to try ClickHouse. You got to try ClickHouse. I have not tried ClickHouse yet, but I need to just because it's been, I, I've seen it in like every single comment section of all my posts. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> nice. Okay, super, super cool, super interesting. So on on that kind of op observability space slash kind of data quality, like that as well, kind of looking in from the outside, like that seems like extremely kind of fragmented. Like there's a lot of kind of like companies around this kind of open source frameworks, et cetera. Like, do you see that kind of converging in any way or is it actually getting getting worse and kind of there's a new thing popping up every day? Yeah, I think it's going to be similar to a uh, kind of distributed compute environment when like when like a um especially when like a competitor gets tested, then uh you see this pr proliferation happen, right? And this is also happening like with uh orchestration, right? Because you have Airflow is kind of like the giant uh, incumbent and then there's all these like competitors, right? You have like you have like Mage, you have Prefect, you have Dagster, you have like all these other kind of orchestration layers that are like competing, and like you can see it kind of like proliferating a little bit. Then it kind of generally what happens like like in distributed compute, it, this happened with like you started with like Java MapReduce, MapReduce was like the king, and then you had like all of these things. You had like Hive and Pig and Drill and Uh, there was like there was like seven other ones, and then and then Spark came along, and then everyone just realized that Spark was like the Spark was just so much better than all of those other ones that like these companies made these big pushes of like okay we need to everyone get on Spark, and that's and it's great when you have that consistency right where it's like hey everyone's doing the same thing and we're all talking about the same stuff, and I think that uh, like. One of the companies that I find that is probably going to be leading there is definitely DBT. I think DBT is one of the ones that really has a good like um, like foothold in that kind of data quality environment. It's like and the, and it's so good, it's crazy. So I live by this place called Death by Taco, and it's DBT, right? And I'm always I, every time I walk by, it's like. I'm just like, it's so funny. And I get that. I get a laugh about that almost every day now. So, uh, and like, uh, like, and, uh, but yeah, like, I think that that's what's going to happen though, is that there's going to be this kind of same thing, proliferation, people learn from each other. And then there's going to probably be more of a consolidation sort of thing that happens, but maybe not because the thing is, is like the consolidation stuff really only ever happens when you have a technology that is like an order of magnitude better. Right. If it's not an order of magnitude better, then the, there's not enough of uh, motivation to get people to switch. And that's uh, and I think that's one of the things that's tricky with Airflow is that Airflow is like is kind of annoying to work with, but the replacements aren't good enough to make the switch, to pay the price to make the switch. And I think that is good. that's one of the things that these other orchestration companies are realizing is that like that is the hard, that's the hard part for sure. Gotcha. So look, looking back, right, when you started in 2014, like you were also working on data pipelines, et cetera. It's not like data quality didn't matter back then, right? Like it was yeah. like equally important in a sense. So like, how did you actually tackle these problems back then? Kind of like, why, why do you only have these platforms in a sense emerging now? Yeah. I mean, also back then, like pipeline development was a lot slower. Like that was, I guess that was one of the things that's like, One, like, like you couldn't, like, uh, at, at when I worked at Teradata, right, uh, the pipelines we worked on, like, this was, like, they didn't even have Hive yet adopted yet at Teradata. Even though Hive existed, they didn't have it yet. 
So we just had to use Java MapReduce for everything. And so uh, that's like where you essentially have to write your own query engine parser thing. It's very like, it's a, it's, it's, it, it feels like almost one layer down, kind of like the work that you do. Like it's like, but you do it for every single job, right? And that's how it used to be, right? And so um, like, at least from the perspective of the pipeline development, that was a part of it. But the testing part, you're totally right in the fact that like after the big data part is crunched, that part has been pretty similar, right? Where it's like, then you have this pattern, right? You have a thing called, uh, and, and I've seen this pattern like for my whole career, essentially. It's crazy. I've also seen it at place, uh, companies that don't use this. Like Facebook actually was uh, an exception to this pattern. So this pattern called write, audit, publish, where you know, so you have your big data pipeline right to a staging table. Then you run your audits to test it. And then if they pass, you move the data from staging to production. And, you, and, and that's the contract, right? And the audits are your guarantees. Like, and those that, that, that's where you can like run some like really lightweight kind of SQL queries or like sample. Like back then we didn't even do it on the full data set. We just did sampling because the SQL, like we didn't have Presto. We didn't have the, dis, the nice like distributed SQL queries. And like we weren't going to write another MapReduce job to test the data that we already wrote with the other MapReduce job, which was so painful. So like uh, what we did instead is like we just did, did sampling and we we're like, okay, that's good enough. That's one of the things I like about this new world, though, is that like with these new technologies, you do get guarantees. Like you actually do get full guarantees of like this data is high quality. And so that's like where you do have this interesting. That's why I like this new world, even though there are so many tools. And like, I hate the proliferation of things because it's like, why can't we all just agree on something? But like, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I also think that I really like the up level and quality for sure. Right. So in the sense, kind of like maturation of the space and some things becoming easier or less work kind of lifts you up to now at the point where you can actually kind of, uh, yeah, kind of like focus more on those like quality aspects, kind of uh, observability aspects, etc. Any kind of like closing, closing words on, on your end, right? Kind of anything you, you wanted to talk about yeah. that we didn't get to. That- yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot in this data engineering world that like is important to remember. And, uh, this is a couple of closing things that I think here are like, one is that like getting into this field is not like data science. It's not like it's like easier. <laughs> and that's a, a, and if you are someone who's considering getting into it, definitely uh, try it out. It's something that is like maybe a six month to a one year road. Like you don't even really need a computer science degree. There's a lot of people who I know who are getting into data engineering with no degree or like an unrelated degree. And so you can really get pretty far into this field if you could just get the right learnings and get the right teachings from like the right people. And that is something that can really change your life because data engineering pays pretty well and it's going to be a big part of the future. There's a lot of job growth in this area. It's like, my opinion, it's actually the job like uh, that is going to see way more job growth than data science because people are realizing that a lot of the data science roles that they hired for were actually data engineering roles. And uh, that's a big kind of shift that's happening that uh, is making data engineering grow really quickly. So yeah, that's I mean, that's that was my main closing thing is like, if you have any thoughts about like breaking in, like, and you want to try it, def- definitely, definitely try it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Awesome. Perfect. Then thank, thank you so much for joining in, Zach. It uh, was, was a pleasure having you. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, it was great being here. The Data Engineering Show is brought to you by Firebolt. It's the cloud data warehouse for insanely fast analytics over terabytes of data with fewer resources.